Welcome to the FAA Production Studios and the FAA Safety Center, National Resource Center in beautiful Lakeland, Florida. Our next presenter is the Chief Flight Instructor for the AOPA Air Safety Foundation. He's a former Boeing 767 captain and Czech Airman for American Airlines. He's been an active CFI for more than 29 years and has logged over 13,500 hours. He says he got the hours the same way you did, one hour at a time. He teaches regularly out of his home base in Frederick, Maryland. He owns a Cessna 172 and flies both for business and for pleasure. I think it's all pleasure, isn't it? He is a regular on the aviation speaking circuit, appearing at the AOPA Expo, Sun and Fun, Local 99's groups, and Civil Air Patrol. His topic today is GPS from the ground up. Let's welcome J.J. Greenway. Thank you very much, Walt. You know, we all have our favorite uh, GPS stories, and uh, I have a handful of them, but my very favorite one happened to me today, or the day before yesterday, I guess it was, on my way down here. I uh, flew down from uh, Frederick, Maryland with my boss, Bruce Landsberg. Anyone heard my boss, Bruce Landsberg, speak? He's not in here, is he? Good. I'll tell us a little story on him. So we had a beautiful flight down in, uh, in our Bonanza and stopped once for gas and had a sandwich and landed down at uh, Vandenberg there, Tampa Executive, and parked the airplane and got in the rental car. And Bruce insisted on getting one of those uh, GPSs that goes in the rental car. Well, I have the GPS all figured out in the airplane. That's no problem, but I'm not real good on these ones in the rental car. So he was driving, and I programmed in the Hilton Garden Hotel. That's where we're staying here in, uh, in Lakeland. And I programmed it all in, Hilton Garden and Lakeland, and pushed all the buttons, and it said, there is no Hilton Garden in Lakeland. I knew there was, because I had a confirmation number. So he's, he was kind of frustrated. He said, well, put, put in Hooters. So I typed in Hooters. H was still there from the Hilton Garden. And I typed H-O-O-T, and all of a sudden it came up with a screen that said, nearest Hooters? <laughs> so... Uh, the GPS couldn't get me to the Hilton, but uh, I don't know if there's some, uh, some uh, advertising uh, going on there with, uh, with Garmin or what it was, but it sure could find the nearest Hooters. So GPS, a wonderful thing here. Uh, before we launch into it, uh, I want to talk a little bit about our airport support network that we have at the AOPA. That's one of the things. we have any AOPA members in here? Oh, good, just about everyone. Uh, the AOPA tent is over at the other side there. Today's uh, AOPA day, so stop in if you haven't already. Uh, and see us over there. One of the things we do with your uh, $39 a year is we go out to bat for the support of airports that may be in danger of being closed or restrictions placed on those airports and we try to have somebody on the ground to be our eyes and ears uh, at AOPA and let us know if there's going to be any encroachment on any airports so we can get in there and send in a legal team if necessary or we can get in there and um, maybe attend a few council meetings or at the state level if we need to so we have volunteers at uh, just about every public use airport around that uh, are the eyes and ears on the ground for AOPA. really doesn't involve much, just getting back to us if you hear of anything uh, going on at your local airport. If you're from this local area, these uh, 10 airports here are airports that do not currently have volunteers or possibly may have some, uh, something coming up against them. So if any of these airports are near and dear to you and you wish to volunteer any of your time to help us out, and be our eyes and ears on the ground. Uh, stop by our tent and see our folks at the Airport Support Network and uh, see if we can get you signed up for helping out with us. A couple of things in the course here. As far as uh, obtaining WINGS credit, if you're interested in obtaining WINGS credit for this course, um, there will be a sign-up sheet going around. That's one way to do it. And uh, we're sort of in the middle of a transition period with the WINGS program. So uh, if you want to cover yourself and make sure that you absolutely do get WINGS credit, uh, you can sign up on the registration card uh, that we have back in the back and leave it back there and we'll take those back and uh, you will get credit for the WINGS program that way. Uh, I am so sure that I can get you WINGS credit for this course that I have my own email address right up there so you can use me for the approving instructor uh, for the WINGS course uh, or use the AOPA ASF address up there too to get your WINGS credit. Uh, there are a few FAST uh, team representatives here afterwards. If you have any questions on the WINGS program, I'm certain that they would be happy to answer those. 
Also, if uh, you participate in your insurance company with any of the accident forgiveness programs, this course qualifies for that as well. A couple items of housekeeping. Uh, as far as the deliverables, what we have in the course, um, you'll see this little button on here, the yellow button for VFR content and the blue button for IFR content. Instrument rated pilots in here, show of hands, usually about half. Good, it's more than half. Uh, if you're a VFR only pilot, some of the, the uh, IFR content is interesting. Uh, stick with it. Sounds a little complicated at first, but the more we use this GPS uh, technology, um, the more of it you'll be familiar with. I'm not talking so much about specific units uh, in this, and I'm not a salesman for Garmin. You'll see a lot of Garmin products because that uh, seems to be dominating the market right now, but the uh, Lawrence units and the Honeywell, uh, Bendix King formerly, uh, those are out there as well. I don't want to talk about the specific units and how to use uh, specific knobology and button pushing, but just about the overall integration of GPS into our operations. Uh, and you'll see uh, how quickly we've come just in the 13 to 14 years that we've been legally navigating with GPS, uh, VFR and IFR, how quickly this has worked its way into our cockpits. Let's take a look at some of the, uh, the typical, does anyone in, in here have any of these units right here? Uh, the 396, 496, very good. I'm still running with an old 195 myself. I'm the only one in the world that's got an old 195. Uh, no, I guess I am, okay. Uh, but uh, some of this, uh, the new technology on the 696 um, for your knee board. Got to have a really big knee board for that, but it's a very capable unit. Some of the, just some of the uh, common handhelds that are out there. Some of the VFR panel mounts, and we'll talk a little bit more about these later. And these are some of the early generation VFR panel mounts that uh, pretty much fit into the same size radio stack hole as the NAVCOMs that formerly occupied that space. And then the uh, panel mount, the uh, integrated units, the G1000, the Avidyne, uh, Chelton, some of the newer ones uh, that are the IFR, VFR that really comprise the whole panel, such as we have in some of our newer airplanes. Take a look at some of the things. When I talk about integrated GPS, um, whether data link or XM uplink uh, to the GPS units, this really doesn't have anything to do with GPS, but it's being displayed on the same screen as the GPS and so you're seeing a lot more of that out there. Terrain avoidance. Big offshoot of the uh, American Airlines 757 accident down in uh, approaching Cali, Colombia, down in, uh, in uh, South America in 1995, Christmas season. Uh, a 757, perfectly capable airplane, just when the pilots were a little disoriented, descended into terrain. And it wasn't long after that that uh, a couple of smart heads got together and realized that terrain data could be displayed on the same screen that navigation is displayed. All the data for the world was pretty sufficiently mapped out, for most of the world anyway. So now even some of our most basic handhelds have terrain data available right on the same screen as we're getting our navigation information. Fuel management. And you can see on the screen, I'll point with a cursor, you might see it a little bit better, um, the fuel range uh, rings right here. And that uh, this dotted one, if you can just make that out, would be uh, range with reserves and the ultimate range the, the solid green line all the way around uh, would be the um, possible dry tanks range. And fortunately, in this case, it looks like this aircraft uh, was taken in flight, and it looks like it is going to actually make it to Greenland from Labrador across some very cold water. So that's a good thing. Um, fuel flow and all those have to be entered in uh, for starting. But all these are displayed on the same screens that the GPS navigation information is displayed as well. Checklists are another thing. Um, on the Avidyne, um, it's a factory checklist. On some of the Garmin's, it's a checklist that you can actually modify yourself uh, for your own use as you're flying. Traffic displays. Now, you notice as we're going up the ladder here, these are, uh, we should put dollar signs by each one of these. Uh, we're getting into several dollar signs by the traffic displays, but all these things are capable functions of being displayed on your multifunction uh, GPS display. Of course, multifunction like uh, the G1000 units, you're having engine information, navigation information, um, outside air temperature, all sorts of things that we didn't used to have all on one screen are all displayed. And then, of course, on the newer airplanes, and I recently had a chance to fly this, we have the uh, synthetic vision or the highway in the sky. And if you look right up at the uh, magenta boxes up there, if you haven't had a chance to fly one of these, it looks a lot like the video games that your kids or grandkids are probably more familiar with than we are. Um, basically, navigate the delta, the triangles, magenta and yellow, up into the boxes and 
That is the airway. That's the place where the airplane is supposed to be. It makes flying a lot simpler uh, as long as it all works and as long as we know how to use it. But for all this technology, if we could have the sound, please, upstairs. Let's see if we have sound. Are we still getting lost? No sound yet. City, which is only five miles east of the airport. You can actually be close enough um, outside the Class Bravo, but he potentially became into the Class Bravo and was just flying around the city. Now, he's already violated the Class Bravo airspace, but he's just flying. We don't know what he's doing. He proceeds to fly to the approach end of the runway and proceeds to cross the first parallel, then cross the second parallel, then proceed on a downwind. Now, what you don't understand is that we're busy. So now every airplane that was on final is no longer on final. You know, everything's breaking loose. We don't know what this guy's doing. He proceeds to go to the city and he tools around a little bit more and he comes back to the airport. He flies up and down the runway. He called flight service and he says, I'm trying to get this to this particular airport. I'm slightly lost. And he says, well, show me the ground and tell me what you see out there and I can help you. The flight service guy recognized where he was, and he said to follow the particular interstate and then turn left. This gentleman had his 11-year-old son with him in there, and they had a GPS on board. He didn't recognize anything, and it wasn't where he needed to be. He saw the airport and didn't know what he was supposed to be doing, so he calls flight service back, and he says, Listen, I'm still lost. I, I don't know where I am. I'm over this small little city and this small airport, and I just don't know where I am. So the flight service guy says to him, well, what do you see? He says, well, I'm flying around the sea. I see a football stadium. And the flight service guy says, well, what does it say? He says, well, it says Erickson. He goes, Erickson? You're in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's a big airport. He goes, well, I, I didn't see any airplanes. And the reason he didn't see any airplanes is because we pulled them all off the final because he was flying all around our airport. So there wasn't anybody moving but him. We finally... The flight service guy gave him the frequency, told him to call Charlotte. And we made him land, and we talked to him big time. So his son was working the GPS and didn't quite know how to work it. That's how come they got lost. Anne Marie is somewhat of an, uh, an exaggerator. I heard that they did a little bit more than talk to him big time. I think there was some certificate action that was taken on this gentleman. The only point is um, this thing is all too familiar. Uh, we get the stories from controllers that we interviewed for this course. It's all too familiar that when people get lost big time, they have quite a bit of sophisticated equipment on board uh, too much of the time that uh, should keep them from getting lost big time. But this seems to happen all the time. There's, there's pilots that are straying off course, straying into uh, airspace they shouldn't be in, uh, particularly up where we come from in Washington, D.C. We get a lot of that. And to an airplane, uh, virtually every single one of these airplanes has had gross navigation violations uh, in restricted airspace and prohibited airspace in the D.C. area has GPS on board that's capable of navigating to within a couple of feet, but yet they are navigating uh, off by as many as uh, three, four, five, ten miles. Some more of the VFR handheld units just going through here, and this, some of these may look familiar to you. Uh, and the capability of these uh, we draw out here. They all have, uh, the new uh, handheld units all have weather capability. And moving on, you see some have traffic capability. Uh, more have uh, airport information as well. And then on the far right, the synthetic vision, uh, which we'll look at in a panel mount in just a minute, is also available on some of the VFR handheld units. As far as the IFR mounted units, some of the early generation ones you see at the top, the KLN 94 uh, and the GNS 80, which uh, became a, a Garmin product here that was originally made by Apollo. Uh, the King, and then of course the uh, new uh, WAS iteration of the old uh, 430 and 530. Who's flying with a Garmin 430 and 530 in here? Just curious. Good, okay. Fair, and uh, the 530W, 430W, has anyone gotten the upgrade for that? Working pretty good for you? No big problems other than the uh, initial shell out for the uh, expense of, of the WAS upgrade, okay? I can appreciate that. Some of the, uh, the capabilities of some of the, the newer panel mount units. Um, of course, they all are WAS except for the original 430 and 530. Traffic information is available on all of them, usually at an extra charge for the subscription. Um, the ability to link in IFR airways as opposed to just putting point-to-point -point navigation, uh, not available on the 430-530. And usable as a source, sole source of navigation, of course, is a function we'll talk about a little bit later uh, as being um, whether or not it's WAS enabled. Otherwise, we need VOR backup such as we have on the Garmin 430 and 530. 
Moving into the integrated uh, the panels, uh, such as some of the new things we see for sale out here uh, with the glass panel with GPS functions. Of course, we have the integrated uh, GP, uh, the G1000 and the, the Perspective and the new Cirrus, of course, and the G600. Is it the same thing as uh, just uh, IFR panel mounts? Not exactly the same thing because an integrated GPS uh, if your GPS is not receiving or not working, you really have blank screens up there. You have no information up there. A lot of crossover in the operation of these units, though. Some of the capabilities of these, um, they all, on the uh, integrated units, the PFD or the primary flight display, that is all powered by the GPS. Um, and going down up into the, once again, we have the dollar signs, uh, all the way to the integrated autopilot uh, available in the newer Garmin units. And of course, the new Cirrus Perspective with the easy button, uh, the bailout button. If you look in the cockpit on those, you'll see the little blue button. Some of the early iterations on this, um, on, on the GPS, and like I said, in just 13 or 14 years we've been doing this, think of how far we've come. Um, who flies out of this area, uh, out of any of the airports in the local area? Okay, very good. Um, anybody know the northerly latitude of this area? Herc? You're thinking of westerly longitude. North, northerly latitude, how much? 30? 28? 20 or 30? I'll buy that. Why do we know that? It's not something you have to know. It's not on the private pilot uh, um, knowledge test. Um, remember the early GPSs we had to, uh, or early LORANs and GPSs, we had to actually be familiar with latitude and longitude. We couldn't simply enter KLAL or KDFW, we have, had to actually know that San Juan, Puerto Rico was 18265 You had to load that in. So our, our brains as pilots, when all this new navigation first came out, filled up with, I will call it utterly useless information because um, it's nice to know um, what the latitude and longitude of a certain uh, city is or a certain airport, but now that we can initialize or we can start out or we can load a flight plan not with uh, geographical coordinates but with simply the names of the intersections. And in, in, the, in the less than 15 years that we've gone from uh, these units displayed here to the units we have now, we've gotten the capability just to enter place names, such as uh, the 430 and the 530. We have a great display of data out there and a moving map that is the second generation moving map, really, easy to read, maybe not real big. Those of us that are getting older maybe need uh, cheater glasses on it. All the way up to the, uh, the G1000 display, and of course you can see um, how easy it is uh, to see the uh, artificial horizon when it's uh, a foot wide and it's right in front of you. One of the other uh, AOPA staffers and I recently uh, got Cirrus qualified as Cirrus instructors in that nice Cirrus that you see out there in front of the AOPA tent. And uh, we are both uh, 40 something, shall I say? Um, that's a good way to say it. So we're not... Uh, Actually, Dave wrote an article about it in one of the recent pilot magazines. We're not really the most uh, teachable people in the world, but uh, one thing I really appreciated the very most was looking over out of the corner of my eye and being able to see a, a horizon that was almost a foot wide there. So no matter how distracted I was in the cockpit, I could see that, uh, I could see that horizon. The um, G1000, the, the newest, the uh, perspective technology, and... Uh, of course, you can see I mentioned before the level button or the bailout button on the Cirrus. If things get bad, then push that button and the airplane will right itself and come back to a, uh, a fairly normal attitude. All part of the integrated GPS functions. Synthetic vision, simply uh, just taking the terrain database and matching the terrain database to what we have available for display on the screen and making an artificial, not just an artificial horizon, but artificial ground out of it too and artificial airport out of it too where there is an airport. Let's take a look at uh, just a, a quick run through. There's no audio associated with this, but just a quick run through of what it looks like on the um, Cirrus perspective display with the synthetic terrain. And this is actually filmed in flight. When we look out at the screen, we will look at the screen, we won't look out the window. And take a look at the terrain as we turn toward higher terrain we're turning into. Of course, you see sea level in blue and coastal areas in green. And this is headed towards terrain. You see terrain that's a threat is going to turn red. As the threat mitigates and we turn away from it, it becomes a little more benign color. 
And we're going to clear the terrain so it's only in amber at that point. And we have a terrain warning flashing right above there, you can see, and stopped flashing. We actually have a pull-up warning flashing there. And this is all just de generated from the uh, stored terrain data. Now we're actually headed toward a runway right there in the very center of the picture. Once again, this is all synthetically generated. And as we head toward the runway, it gets bigger just like it would get in, uh, in real life if we were looking out the window. We almost have enough visual cues to flare looking down. And this has actually been tested by NASA. Not quite perfected yet, but it's working pretty well. I don't know about you, but I'm never that close to the center line. So uh, the synthetic vision is, is really pretty good. I'm going to ask a few pop quizzes uh, as we go through here, see who's up to snuff on their GPS regulations. When do you need current GPS data? IFR? How about uh, when you get an FAA ramp check? <laughs> there's, there's a couple of pop quiz questions in here, and the answer to all of them except one is it depends. Uh, for this one, I'm going to have to say it depends because uh, current GPS data, um, IFR, yeah, you should have it. You technically don't need it uh, if you have in route fixes that you can identify the position on. Uh, you're allowed to fly with an expired database. Uh, certainly being employed by the Air Safety Foundation of AOPA, I, I would never advocate anyone flying with an expired database. We'll talk about uh, some things that can happen if you do in a couple of minutes. But um, good to brush up in AIM when you actually have to have legally current uh, data. A um, couple of things that have uh, come up, uh, the ASRS reports, the NASA Safety Reporting System. Um, we looked in and we weren't looking for accidents. We found plenty of accidents that were related to GPS, but incidents, things that have happened that people reported themselves on. Here is one, uh, one report where there was a new GPS database and it was slightly out of date and the direct function was used to go to a waypoint. The name was the same on the waypoint, but the location had changed on the waypoint. This is why every 28 days a new revision cycle comes out and uh, you may be a little bit behind on your GPS, but a word to the wise, um, it's, there's a lot of changes like this that happen, particularly if you fly over a wide area that can be real gotchas. Let's go actually uh, go out and, and apply some of these things we've been talking about to actually flying in the, with the GPS. And we'll run through some of the phases of flight, pre-flight, taxi, and so on. And we'll go out and we'll look at um, some of the gotchas, some of the pitfalls that come in both flying IFR and VFR. In the pre-flight, not that our briefings that we get aren't long enough as it is, but now there's all the more to be added to our briefings. There's the uh, GPS and WAS NOTAMs. If you look carefully in there, particularly in areas of, uh, of national security interests, um, there's a lot of funny things that go on. You'll see a NOTAM that'll say something to the effect that uh, GPS signals within a 10 nautical mile radius of such and such a fix are unreliable. Um, I take it maybe these are questions we shouldn't ask why, but um, that does happen, particularly, like I say, up in the D.C. area. So we're going to want to check those GPS and WAS NOTAMs prior to depending on GPS for a sole source of navigation. Minimum altitudes. Why minimum altitudes? We're doing some things with GPS that we don't normally do. We're striking off across an area that uh, maybe there is no airway. Um, around here, not so much of a factor uh, since the Florida terrain is all fairly, fairly benign. Out to the mountain west, though, um, an area that you might not normally traverse might have uh, terrain that's in capa uh, in excess of the capability of your airplane. Not a bad, a bad idea to check some of those things, too, uh, as we're using GPS for a sole source of navigation. Airspace as well, and this is a gotcha. All the uh, TFRs that have sprung up post 9-11, and uh, we're talking about uh, security TFRs in, uh, in general, but uh, don't forget the stadium TFRs when the, uh, when the uh, sports complexes are activated and there's a large enough sports event going on so that um, the airspace over that is restricted or Disneyland as we have over here in Orlando, uh, always restricted. So there's some um, restrictions that are not widely published. The controllers may not know uh, on the tip of their tongue to be able to tell you about it, but it's incumbent upon me as the pilot when I go out and navigate with GPS, if I'm over an area that's going to have some restrictions, I need to know that. Controllers are a good source of last minute information. I know if a game runs overtime or something and the restricted airspace is going to last a little bit longer, uh, the controllers often are informed of that, but it still is a pilot responsibility flying VFR to check some of these things. 
some of the good resources that are out there. FlightAware has some good things, uh, resources on, on uh, pre-flight items uh, involving GPS and of course on the AOPA Internet Flight Planner. Um, the new iteration of that, we're working to make that as useful as we possibly can. Entering the uh, route and the waypoints, I mentioned earlier that uh, a couple of the units, the 480 G, uh, Garmin and the uh, Honeywell, have the ability to enter um, airways, a jet airway or a Victor airway into the route, but uh, the 430 and 530, we have to enter intersections in. Now, an exhortation not to be too lazy, you have a VOR on this end of the route and a VOR on this end of the route, and it looks like a straight line between them, but there might be five, six, seven, or eight intersections between them. Resist the impulse just to load just those VORs on either end of the route uh, because you don't know the small nuances of that airway. There may be a slight curve in there, a slight bend. We want the most accurate navigation that we can get as we go through this. So we're going to want to make sure that we load uh, as many of those uh, intersections between the two VORs that compose the airway as we can just to improve the accuracy in navigations. The uh, ICAO identifier, this is a big one. Um, there were uh, a lot of navigation errors that used to occur uh, over the years where the VOR was the same name as the airport. The FAA has tried to get away from naming the VOR the same name as the airport and uh, there are still some. I know up in, uh, in our area we have Martinsburg, West Virginia, VOR, MRB, and Martinsburg, West Virginia Airport, KMRB, and they're about six miles apart. So if you're navigating to what you think is MRB, the airport, uh, you'll get there and you still have another six miles to go. Like I say, there's still uh, a handful of these around in a lot of areas, but the FAA is really working to separate the names of the VOR from the names of the airport. Current data, like I said, every 28 days there's a data cycle change uh, if you're not getting current data uh, with, with the latest, at least find out what changed so there's no surprises. Another ASRS incident that uh, we got wind of that occurred was the uh, pilot actually forgot to enter the K in front of the airport, and sure enough, it took him to uh, the VOR of the same name, three letters, instead of with a K in front of it, and uh, he was rather surprised and got an airspace violation when he entered Cincinnati's Class B airspace. A couple of the, uh, the, the flying direct gotchas, um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, minimum altitudes. Um, IFR, this isn't going to be a problem. The controllers aren't going to clear you for an altitude that's below what's uh, their minimum vectoring altitude if they're maintaining radar contact. Um, however, it just makes us look better as a pilot if we are flying IFR that we do pick an altitude to file uh, that meets the minimum uh, altitudes, not just clearing the terrain but recall once again the terrain clearance requirements for IFR, uh, 1,000 feet in non-mountainous airspace, 2,000 feet in, in uh, mountainous airspace. So if we're going to file IFR in a direct routing, that we can actually uh, file an altitude that makes sense to ATC that's going to closely match the altitude that we're assigned in our clearance. And of course, like I mentioned before, airspace uh, restrictions as well as far as filing. Getting a little bit less common uh, for a lot of our GA operations, but in some of the busy airports we have the RNAV DPs, departure procedures, and the RNAV STARS, the standard terminal arrivals. Um, once again, the restriction for this is these have to be in the database. These are not things that can be manually entered. We can't use it if it's not in the database. Last uh, June, June of 08, it's just coming up on a year that if uh, RNAV arrivals and departures are going to be used, um, the ICAO flight plan, the international flight plan is used, and that's not one that uh, a lot of us use much in our daily operations, if at all, but it's the standard form that's used worldwide. The airlines are all using this in the United States now, the ICAO flight plan, since airlines are operating on slant golf and using RNAV departures and arrivals. Of course, most of us are still using the same old flight plan that we've always been using, which is uh, perfectly uh, okay to use for our operations that do not involve RNAV departures and arrivals. This is one that, uh, it's a little easier than it sounds. We hear a lot about RAIM, the Receiver Autonomous Integrity Monitoring, and that's basically the uh, mistakes that a GPS knows it's going to make. So let's talk about that for a minute. We can check it um, on the unit itself. And there's two kinds of RAIM. There's RAIM where the unit itself thinks that it's faulty and it's going to give you bad information. And then there's 
uh, other kind of uh, a RAIM uh, problem that develops when the satellite geometry or the satellites are not lined up in order to give you a good signal. The RAIM prediction that your unit will give you for your arrival time and you enter your arrival time at a particular airport, the prediction, uh, it doesn't know the health of the unit, but it predicts where the satellites are going to be and it predicts whether or not you're going to have good navigation signal. That's on the non-WAS units. Now I know the people have said they had a 430 and a 530W are flying the WAS units. How many people are flying a WAS enabled GPS? Good, we've got a handful that are flying WAS enabled. One of the things that you paid extra for with that WAS enabled GPS is F, D, and E, flight dete or, uh, fault detection and exclusion. And fault detection and exclusion, basically your WAS GPS, it's a good thing since you paid so much for it, it's able to think for itself and it decides whether or not it is going to be good enough for your arrival time and then it won't give you navigation signals if it thinks it's going to give you faulty navigation signals. So it's kind of a smart GPS, I guess you could call it. Um, so you don't have to worry so much about pre-planning uh, your, your RAIM capability if you have WAS enabled GPS. It's going to tell you if you have a problem. No matter what happens though, uh, we need, need to know what's going to uh, incur if we, uh, or what's going to ensue if we have a RAIM problem, we don't have uh, good navigation signals. Do you have a plan B? Well, we all have a plexiglass windshield, so that's a pretty good plan B for VFR operations. Um, hopefully, uh, we have a backup plan. I know most of us have taken the ADFs out of our airplane. Actually, I don't speak for myself. I still have one. But uh, we still have VOR capability in most of our airplanes. Very few people are running around with sole GPS navigation. So we still have that capability as well. So that's some of the things we do in the pre-flight. Taxiing. Really good idea to uh, do as much as we can uh, with the uh, clearance and getting our um, data loaded into the machine. Try to load things up before we leave the uh, parking area, before we leave the uh, hangar, before we leave the tie down. Uh, some of these GPS units will store a route in there. Uh, others, uh, you have the capability of entering a route, uh, a repeated route, and storing it in there. But uh, you take a look at the airlines. When you taxi out on an airliner, you're not spending a lot of time in the run-up pad, if there is a run-up pad. Um, everything's loaded before you leave the gate. It's one thing you're paying for with an airline ticket. A couple of people up there are loading everything, all the navigation equipment, and uh, really the only thing that's happening when an airliner is taxiing is the pilots are looking out the window, talking to ATC on the radio. Runway incursions is a real hot issue right now. The FAA has an Office of Runway Safety up in Washington, D.C. at headquarters that is a, a, um, a very good source of um, FAA employees, let's just say. I spend a lot of time down there, and there is a lot of people in the office, and the FAA is really hot on this, and it's a big issue. Um, us GA pilots, and particularly not watching where we're going, running out onto runways at particularly busy airports, does not go over with the FAA very well, nor with the general public when we uh, trade paint or trade aluminum with another airplane out there. Ground navigation, there's some great things out there. Some of these new units, uh, I've noticed when you land, you will automatically get a screen that pops up of the airport diagram, and there you are, that little airport airplane on the taxiway, uh, it knows where you are when you land. Real nice for finding your way around an airport, particularly an unfamiliar airport, but a real easy way to get fixated heads down uh, and looking at some things that you shouldn't be looking at when you uh, should be looking out at taxiways, other airplanes, and uh, adhering to the ATC clearance. Another ASRS report that came out uh, at a non-towered airport, the Cessna was rolling out on the runway after he landed in uh, sites of Bonanza taxiing out onto the runway. Neither one of them had a chance to say anything. The Bonanza didn't see the Cessna, and somebody yelled on the Unicom frequency, Stop! And uh, the Bonanza did stop but he admitted in his report that he actually was um, loading the GPS and his feet had eased up on the brakes a little bit and uh, what could have been a disaster was pretty narrowly averted but uh, the pilot realized that he distracted himself um, with the GPS. You know, and that's one of the things I just, I just want to mention in here uh, and this is really primarily what we concern ourselves with at the Air Safety Foundation. Walking around the grounds here at Sun and Fun, I see some, some fantastic equipment out there and uh, I hope someday to have some of it mounted in my airplane, or better yet, have an airplane with, uh, with some of it in it. But when you look at the safety record, and, and we look at these things every day uh, at the Air Safety Foundation, we look at uh, the accidents that come across our desk, and we analyze every single one of them, 
And of course, as the proliferation of, of higher capability airplanes is more and more, we're not seeing a reduction in accident rate. So this is really good equipment out there, but us as pilots are not using it uh, to the extent of its capability and to the extent of our ability. Good things out there, but it's not keeping us from getting lost necessarily. Um, so I, I think we kind of have to grow. I think the technology has probably gotten a little bit ahead of the training. And I will be the first to admit that even though I'm qualified to teach in the Cirrus, uh, there's a lot that I still need to learn about it. It's, it's a very, very capable airplane. And in the period of, of one generation, airplanes have come from something that you could go from one to another to another and not necessarily need to know specifics because the avionics were all real similar but we've gotten airplanes that have become much more type specific so it's incumbent upon us as the pilot to jump in and learn as much as we need to know to be safe about these things. We all like looking at the moving map it's probably the easiest thing to look at in the cockpit but uh, don't forget that magenta line is just a nice thing to have on that moving map it is not the sole source of navigation. Virtually all legal IFR GPS installations have a CDI, either an electronic CDI or the old steam gauge CDI like you see in this picture on the slide. We have moving needles. That is your sole source of IFR GPS navigation uh, and that is the GPS itself is driving uh, the CDI needles, of course deviation indicator needles. On departure, being cleared uh, for a change right after takeoff seems to be, I know the controllers, uh, we have any air traffic controllers in here? I wasn't going to take any poke at any controllers because we actually had a controller help us make this course. We'll hear from him toward the end of the course. But uh, it, always, it almost seems like the controllers, uh, right at that most critical moment after departure, want to make your life really difficult and give you a clearance to some place that even, isn't even on your flight plan. So. Uh, you press the nearest button and you don't see it in there and you press the direct and you don't see it in there and you're not quite sure how to modify that, v that GPS flight plan that you spent so much time putting into the GPS before you started the engine. Uh, ask ATC for vectors. This is not a test. If ATC gives you something different than what you originally cleared, they're doing that for a reason. And uh, don't, you won't get a hero medal if you spend five minutes trying to put in what you thought the name of the intersection was. Real easy request. Say, uh, departure, I'm not quite sure, uh, I have that in, uh, in the GPS, can you give me a vector and get me started in that direction? And I'll bet you, nine times out of ten or 99 times out of 100, the controller will say, sure, fly heading 105, and uh, when you have uh, that loaded up, then proceed direct. Pretty common ATC exchange. Uh, this is not a test. This ATC just wants to get you on your way expeditiously and efficiently and keep you free of other traffic. Is GPS approved for a sole source of sole means of navigation? Pop quiz. Any yeses? Any noes? No? WAS, ah, good. Okay, WAS GPS is a sole, sole means of navigation. Non-WAS GPS, of course, we're going to have a VOR backup to it. If we start looking at the intricacies of the, that regulation and that uh, technical order, you'll find out it doesn't necessarily have to be an operational VOR, but I don't want to go that far into it, but you do need backup. But yeah, WAS GPS is approved for a sole uh, source of navigation. Jump into the en route phase. Editing waypoints or inserting another waypoint in, there is some drastically different ways of doing this on different units. And that's why I said at the very beginning of this course I wasn't going to speak to any particular uh, Garmin or Honeywell or Bendix King or Lawrence unit. Um, but editing waypoints is drastically different. It's not something we do every day. Not a bad idea to make sure that you can uh, insert another waypoint into your route or if you have the capability of inserting an airway or a jetway into your route, make sure you know how to insert that into the, uh, into the overall flight plan and activate the flight plan. Once again, asking for an initial vector uh, prior to reprogramming the GPS is a good way to get you on your way, headed in the right direction, and then at your own leisure time, you can reprogram your GPS. Autopilot is not a bad deal here. It's worth its weight in gold if you've got to spend any time heads down. And if you do spend any time heads down, not a bad idea to make sure you're spending adequate time heads up to look out the window, VFR or IFR, when you have an autopilot. Really good idea for single pilot IFR especially, and, uh, and not a bad idea for long VFR 
uh, flights either. Only problem with autopilots is they're autopilots. They will do exactly what you tell them, even if it's not the right thing. And I like to try to get in the habit when I'm flying with another pilot, particularly of, uh, of asking the other pilot, how does that look to you before I actually re-engage the autopilot after making a change? And at least then if something goes wrong, then I have somebody else to share the blame with, right? It's kind of like being married. So uh, take a look at what you've selected, what you've done uh, with, the auto, with the route in the GPS before you actually make uh, something as mechanical as an autopilot uh, set out to fly the route. We're getting these more, uh, actually some of the first ones started in the great state of Florida, uh, headed down south out of Miami. The T routes, the terminal routes, of course those are IFR, uh, RNAV routes only. We can't follow those unless we do have uh, WASP GPS. And they're marked on the chart with the uh, blue box and it's preceded by a T for a terminal route. Just more nomenclature of things that we're seeing on charts uh, now that the GPS is getting a little more prolific. We find them in the flight planning software, of course. Um, take a look, and we'll look at these when we look at approaches. We're still in the en route phase, but the fly by waypoints versus the fly over waypoints, and the difference that they are, uh, the different nomenclature on the charts for each one of them. Um, like I say, we will look to see on the approach charts where these are a little more uh, prevalent going, going on. Now, I know we've just had tax time, and uh, none of us are in trouble because we all t paid our tax bills, and they were all smart a little bit from that. But uh, I want to tell you that the government does give us some really good things sometimes. So take a look at this. And this is what, what you got in return for your tax bill. Anyone flown out west before? I'm talking Arizona, Utah, Colorado, Washington State, Oregon. There's some big old MO, uh, MEAs out there. Um, try going westbound out of Denver, and uh, we get MEAs around 14,000, the minimum en route altitudes, 16,000. I don't know about you, but my Cessna 172 doesn't go to 16,000. I had it to 14,000 once, and it wasn't very happy. Certainly wouldn't want to go IFR at that altitude. So think of what uh, an MEA, what, what uh, is an MEA, a minimum en route altitude, composed of? IFR pilots, what is, what, what do you, what is, what's that MEA sitting up there at 14,000 for? I have a VOR here and a VOR here, and I'm going to navigate between those VORs. Why is that MEA so high? Obstructions radar. and radar. I heard. Any, so I heard a VOR in here. A VOR reception. That's a good one. So here we are. Uh, we've had, we'll, we've all had IFR GPSs for years, and they're making us stay up at fourteen thousand feet so we can have VOR reception. There may not be terrain until all the way down around nine thousand feet. So the uh, G. MEAs that you see, and if you look on the slide, they're notated uh, with a G after the MEA. If you have legal en route IFR GPS that you're navigating with, you are uh, quite welcome to use the GMEA. So really what this has done, and I'm glad to see that this is working well because uh, when the en route um, cycle on the chart changes is made every 56 days, I know this sounds kind of nerdy, but I like to get in there and look at them and see how many. And there's been about a dozen every ch chart cycle change there's been about a dozen MEAs that have been lowered. So I figure uh, I will be able to fly my uh, Cessna 172 out to the West Coast IFR uh, pretty soon um, because some of these uh, are coming down lower and lower on these MEAs. Nearest button. Walk around the ramp uh, on not new airplanes but used airplanes and you look, you look on the uh, GPS and that nearest button, there's two buttons that the paint is kind of worn off of. The direct button <laughs> and the nearest button. <laughs> like that a little bit on my GPS too, I will admit. But uh, of course we have not just uh, airports, but uh, a lot of different, we can get nav aids, intersections, NDBs, ATC frequencies. I found a gotcha the other day, and this was flying that, that new Cirrus. I pressed the, uh, I wasn't lost, I was just a little unsure of my position. Um, I pressed the uh, nearest button, I wanted the nearest flight service station so I could get some weather. And it gave me a frequency, and the frequency was 122.1. And that rung a bell from way, way, way back in my private pilot training back when I had here. Any, anyone know anything wrong with that 122.1 frequency? It's re receive only, yeah. And the GPS uh, database didn't say that, it just said 122.1. Of course, remember, when you talk on 122.1, 
I know some of y'all remember this back from when your private pilot training back when you had hair too, uh, but when you talk on that 122.1, you need to be listening on the VOR that's listed on the map. So the GPS database was good, pretty good, but not completely perfectly 100% good because it didn't tell me what frequency I needed to be listening on. So uh, you thought I forgot everything, didn't you, Herb? I remembered that. <coughs> Uh, but still, we need to be looking outside. Um, a lot of capable information out there uh, in, inside the cockpit. Maybe too much capable information for us if we're not looking outside the window. Maybe this has something to do with the, uh, the lack of decrease in the accident rate. I don't know. Mid airs are kind of still where they were. Must you carry paper charts? Another pop quiz. We've got good information. We've got in route information, approach charts. Unless you actually have a unit that's certified for a paperless cockpit, uh, then you do need to carry charts. You may have it all, but it may not be a certified unit. Um, usually the certified units are on more expensive airplanes and there's backup, there's multiple electrical systems, uh, multiple screens, so we can't have a total failure. Um, call me a Luddite if you must, but I still uh, do carry paper charts on, on all my IFR flights. I'm, I'm working towards getting rid of them on some of the airplanes I fly that are capable to do without it, but uh, I do like to have that backup. A couple of different things on the approaches. And uh, like I say, this is uh, for, for IFR pilots mostly. Just in the past 12 months, we've gotten LPV approaches or the localizer performance with vertical capability. It doesn't really stand for that, but that's the closest thing we can think that the FAA might have been thinking about. Uh, we, have, we have those all the way down to a 200 foot decision altitude and a half mile visibility. So GPS, WASP GPS, has finally equaled the capability of the ILS that we've had for uh, so many years and come to know and love. Uh, maybe next we'll get Category 2, Category 3 capability with WAS GPS, I don't know. But right now I'm glad to say that uh, the GPS data is every bit as good as the Category 1 ILS data. And of course we have the uh, localizer performance only and then moving on down just the various degradations of quality uh, that we have in, in the uh, GPS approaches. Like I said before, the uh, top one there, the decision altitude on the LPV, 200 feet to 250 feet, and most of them are being uh, printed now at 200 feet. So very capable uh, uh, units that are coming out there. We haven't had to pay any more. We haven't had to make an upgrade for this with our WAS, but it's just that the FAA has gotten a little more comfortable uh, in flight test of these procedures. They know that they're legal and safe for us to go down to what formerly was only for, for ILS minimums. A lot of difference in the units on uh, loading and activating approaches. Um, good idea to make sure some of the Garmin's right now, if you activate the approach, you really can skip the step of loading the approach. So um, be familiar with what you need to do. If you do fly out of your own private airport, uh, it's tempting, but it's not legal to make your own approach. I know a few people that have. Uh, don't know if anyone's come to grief over it, but the FAA frowns on uh, flying IFR on homemade approaches. The auto sequencing versus the hold button is another one, and how often do you actually really have to hold in real life conditions? Not very often. If you're an instrument instructor, you hold all the time because maybe your uh, student needs the practice, but uh, in real life conditions, I don't find myself being forced to hold more than maybe once a year. So I'm not using that uh, hold button very often, um, and I notice that sometimes if I don't get to it right away, the flight plan will sequence to the next fix beyond the hold rather than remaining at the hold. Another thing to be familiar with uh, on your own specific unit. Remember how I said on these pop quiz questions there were four gotchas and one yes? Can you use your handheld GPS in instrument conditions legally? I got a no? I got a no and a yes. I'm going to go with a yes on this. Hear me out. If you've got any real heartburn with this, uh, talk to me afterwards. But you can use it. You just can't rely on it. So. Um, Here's a scenario for you. You take off, and you're taking off out of Lakeland. Uh, Sunday, Sunday morning, I'm going to fly back home to Maryland in uh, the sweepstakes airplane. And uh, if I only had a handheld GPS and I was stopping at Florence for gas, I could say to the controller, uh, looks like a heading of uh, 010 for Florence. How does that look to you, sir? And the controller might say, fly heading 010 until reaching Florence, uh, direct when able. Is that legal? Yeah, I'm not using it for a sole source. I'm on a radar vector. I've just... Uh, if there's a lawyer in the crowd, he would tell me I'm leading the witness. So after that controller finished his cup of coffee and, and did whatever else he was doing, he probably would get around to giving me that 010 heading. So uh, I'm legally using my, my GPS in uh, IFR conditions. It's good situational awareness. WAS is something uh, that we have. This is something we just own in the United States here. 
Uh, the GPS system came out. We have the satellites that virtually cover the world. A little spotty up in the poles, but we don't spend a lot of time up there. But uh, in the uh, coterminous United States, in the lower 48, uh, basically all we've done is taken ground stations, a couple dozen ground stations, and we synchronize the signal. We get the small errors out. Out on the left coast and out on the right coast, we have uh, master stations that send a signal, corrected signal to a satellite, sends it back down to your WAS unit, and gives you a much better signal. So we took a really good product, turned it into a much better product. Take a look at the accuracy differences, VORs. That uh, circle around the airplane would be the accuracy of two VORs or VOR DME. Watch the circle get smaller as we jump into the GPS. And that's just straight GPS, and that's confined to the wingspan of the airplane, basically. And then take a look at WAS. We're talking about something just the size of the cockpit or the cabin uh, of a GA airplane. So we've gotten to be quite a bit more accurate in this. One way to remember this is uh, the, on the vertical guidance, when you're looking at your approaches, LPV and VNAV has the V in there, and those are the only approaches you're getting with WAS that actually have uh, vertical guidance. Quick word of the wise on this, even if you have vertical guidance and it's a non-precision approach, you may have a DA or a DH listed. It may be like, for you IFR pilots, flying a ILS approach, getting down to decision height. You don't stay at decision height or decision altitude. You make a missed approach. With these, it's just the same. Uh, you're not allowed to necessarily stay at your uh, minimum altitude. It has to be treated like an, like an ILS approach. We looked at these earlier, the, uh, the, the current approaches that are published for WAS, uh, but basically WAS just gives us a heck of a lot more options uh, when it comes to having vertical guidance in an approach. We talked about uh, RNP just a little bit. We touched on it, the required navigational performance. Um, the requirement en route is two miles, and then when we move into the terminal, we get one mile requirement and 0.3 nautical mile requirement on the approach. I will say, if you know something different about that 2.0 miles, we have gotten a couple of different answers from a couple of different FAA offices. Some say it's five miles, some say it's two miles. We've gone with the most restrictive uh, just in the course guidance for this course. So that's the required performance or how accurate your unit has to be in those phases of flight. GPS approaches have actually simplified IFR approaches quite a bit. They're all the basic T shape. They start out at initial approach fixes. And we talk about the fly over waypoints versus the fly by waypoints. Look at the 90 degree angle we're intercepting this approach at. So that's actually a fly by waypoint. That means we can lead the turn. If we flew over it, we'd actually overshoot our course. So we can lead the turn on that. It's a fly by. Take a look at the only fly over waypoint on this approach, and that's the missed approach point. So we actually have to fly over the waypoint for the missed approach point. You actually have a choice when you're being radar vectored, just like being radar vectored for an approach uh, with any other kind of navigation. You can request uh, the full approach, or you can request being uh, your own navigation to a certain fix on the approach. And uh, ATC treats being uh, vectored or navigating for a GPS approach same way they would uh, any other approaches. We talked about uh, holding procedures and suspend versus hold. Um, most of the nomenclature on most of the units that we're using out there, your active uh, line, your active route is in magenta. And you see this magenta line. If the holding pattern is magenta, of course, that's the active holding pattern. Um, fly the airplane. There's a very, very busy time that happens in holding and in a missed approach. So really good idea to make sure your situational awareness is every bit as good as it would be if you didn't have those distractions on board. One of the areas that's still popping up uh, as, as being a problem area for accidents is the missed approach procedure, both in, uh, of course, the traditional airplanes that we're flying, the steam gauges, and in the newer airplanes. People are still hurting themselves on missed approach procedures uh, in sophisticated airplanes. I have a really good idea why, because a missed approach is a really busy time. Number one, number two, you're doing something with your GPS that you don't normally do with it, trying to make it go rather than land. And it's not something we practice all the time, and it's real easy to get caught up and uh, do something that, uh, that leads to some drastic uh, errors at the very last time in the approach. GPS errors, um, if you do mess up the approach entry, uh, forget to arm the approach. These are not particular to the GPS. These are things that can happen on any approach. Um, 
We've all gotten too high on an ILS approach and maybe a and pegged the needle, uh, GP glide slope needle below us and had to ask for a vector off the course. Uh, these can happen on a GPS approach just like they can happen in any kind of approach. Uh, so ATC can be informed. We can get off the approach, get vectored back onto the approach when we're not nearly so distracted and, uh, and try it all over again. There's no, no harm, no foul for having to try the approach again. Once again, an autopilot. Uh, is one of the best ways to mitigate your distractions uh, en route and uh, for approaches as well if, it's, if the autopilot is certified for such. Same old, same old. It's like it's always been with distractions in the cockpit, whether it be open doors or unruly passengers or uh, snakes in the cockpit or bumblebees, what have you. Aviate first. Um, like I say, with all this new stuff out there, let's make this new stuff work for us to be safer uh, rather than being so distracted by the new stuff that it makes us more dangerous. All of these GPS units, to a unit, uh, there's some way to get out of a problem that you've created. On a lot of them, uh, you, there's a bailout key, maybe the map key on the Garmin's, uh, or if you make a mistake, press the wrong key, press that key again, it takes you back. There's no mistakes that you can get into on these, unlike your PC. There's no mistake that you can get into that's uh, going to give you a blank screen and completely freeze you out. There's usually a way to get back to where you were before. Get proper training. Like I said, I don't know everything about every GPS unit. I know a lot about one or two. Find an instructor or somebody that knows a lot about that specific unit and uh, get some proper training on it. It'll go a long ways towards helping you out. Let's look at what uh, ATC's view on this whole thing. If we could have some sound. Well, no sound yet. There we go. Hold on. Well, maybe ATC didn't want to weigh in. Yeah, the problems that we've seen with the GPS and other technology enhancement in the cockpit result in, from my perspective as a controller, a lot of heads down time. You know, fly in the box rather than looking outside, scanning for traffic, scanning for weather, scanning for terrain. And the best advice I could give is be familiar with those gadgets, be familiar with that technology. There's a lot of simulators available online and otherwise before you, you jump in the airplane and try to figure out in the air. Or take a safety pilot with you. Or you want to uh, fly the box, they can look out uh, for planes and weather and, and terrain. And, and if you're going to fly like, with a GPS, slant golf in your flight plan, be prepared to use that equipment to the fullest extent possible. Rather than just a direct to function, know how to load a flight plan, know how to load a holding procedure, know how to navigate to a uh, lap long or a fixed distance radio that the controller might give you because we're going to expect that the pilot can, uh, can utilize that box to the full extent possible. That's ATC's take on the whole thing uh, and, and really it's like I was saying before, uh, don't let the technology overcome what you already know as a professional pilot, as a highly trained pilot and as a safe pilot. Use this uh, technology out there, use it for what it was designed for, uh, keep ourselves safe, keep the dirty side down, the shiny side up, the pointy end forward, and always have a plan that if something changes with this GPS uh, signal that you're getting, that you know exactly what to do, just like you always have, and fly the airplane most of all. Thank you very much for coming. Stay right here, we're still on camera. Have you got any questions? You all can come up and talk with JJ, nose to nose, if you want to. Thank you very much. Uh, JJ, if you just leave that computer right here, we'll okay. raffle it off later. That'd be great. <laughs> Get some determination.